So by looking at all these curves and doing, and, excuse me, and comparing them with other samples that are that are understood and known, we can start gathering information about cross-linking that's going on in the system or different fillers, possibly the molecular weight, gel points, cure times, all of these things. These are some of those qualitative aspects that I said earlier were the tip of the iceberg. You can get that by, by knowing how to interpret the, prime, the curves of G prime and G double prime. In some cases, though, you, uh, you have a reactive material. You can also use the DMA to monitor the cure of the reactive or of, of the reactive material. These are some epoxies that were cured at different temperatures. Uh, curve up on top, it was at 115 degrees C. As you would expect, that cure the fast as it got up and flattened out at the top very fastest. But another thing you'll notice too is that the viscosity at the very beginning was actually the lowest, which is what you expect too. 150 at, at that highest temperature, the initial state of the material before it cures, it's going to be much softer, much runnier than the end cured material is at the temperatures. And so you see that with all of these, at 105 C, 90 C, as well as 75 C. The cure takes longer, but the initial viscosity also ends up being higher as you go down the temperature. So the question is, why can't you get this information from capillary rheology, <coughs> capillary rheology, or slot dyes, or melt index or even Brookfield those times? And that's because all these other instruments operate at a shear rate independent of time. You have to have that variation in time in order to be able to get out G prime and G double prime. If all you have is viscosity, you have one variable, you can't manipulate that backwards to get a second one. A second prime. Whereas if you have G prime, G double prime, you can manipulate that forward to get this concept. Now, sometimes DMA really can't be overkill. Sometimes you really just need to know the viscosity. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. We have book field discounters. We also have capillary discounters for doing polymer mills. It's not a problem. We also, say it's in a corner all by itself, we also do have a melt, um, melt, couple of melt index equipment. Often even that is, is enough to, uh, to measure, or to, is enough of a measurement to help you uh, in, in, what, in what you need. So in summary, sometimes noise viscosity is enough, sometimes it isn't. It, there isn't, there's a huge <coughs> potential for, for gathering other information besides just looking at viscosity. Reality can open up a huge new realms of possibilities that, that you would not otherwise be able to find. And here at Aspen, we do have the, uh, the equipment and the, and the experience to help with, uh, with the solving those questions. That's for the workshop. Any questions? Yes? Could you comment on uh, some of the dangers of relying too heavily on melt index and, and why, <laughs> why one would uh, Look at those data. Well, no, I have a no hate relationship with the milk index, and the polymer industry does too. It's so convenient. There's, there's all, yeah, it's, it's very convenient, yeah. but there's all kinds of problems with it from a, from a fundamental point of view. Okay, um, you don't have a well established flow field. All right, your dye is extremely short. Normally, you want your dye to be about 20, 20 times longer than what the diameter of it is. Make sure that there aren't any entrance effects going on and the flow field is fully established. With melt index, the, the um, dye is only uh, four times longer than the diameter. So you have that going after it right away. Another problem with melt index is that you only measure it at one shear rate. You, know, I can't, you can't even really call it a shear rate for all the reasons that I just, just outlined. Um, you saw already that with, with the uh, polymers, you've got a, a viscosity curve. If you only measure one point on the curve, you can draw an infinite number of curves through that, that one point. Now, those are all the criticisms against it. On the plus side, millions and millions and millions of pounds of polymer uh, thermoplastics are sold, uh, sold every day, more or less just on the basis of melt index. Polyethylene, polypropylene, most of that's sold pretty much just on the basis of melt index. So it's kind of one of those things that works, you know. But you got to be cautious with it. <laughs> Just because the melt index is what it's supposed to be doesn't mean that you're that you're home home free. Those are my thoughts. Can you describe the capillary discount? 
Uh, I can't believe it's down there. You just you have um, it's a die at the end of the extruder, and so you're running the material through a capillary or a slot. You usually have two pressure taps to measure the pressure drop, mass flow rate, and then there's a equation for converting one to the other. You can vary shear, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can get. But the, th uh, the thing with the capillary is, as I mentioned, most instruments you can only vary two, three decades of it. And because you're not working at G prime and G double prime, you can't do tank temperature superposition. So you're limited with that, sh that rate of uh, shear rate. If that happens to be what you need, great. Yeah? No, it works with melted polymers, solids as well. Uh, I mentioned that we have the three-point bending as well as the cantilever and compression. It works in order for the No, melted polymer, you have oscillatory shear going on. Oh, the DNA uses a Yeah. <laughs> and again, you'll see. Um, during the workshop, we'll, we'll be in the uh, lab where we have the uh, material for the, for the liquid molten polymers and everything. I'll give you a brief uh, stop by the, uh, by the cantilever device, but uh, we can't really be out there because that's right next to the other <laughs> talks. We'll be empty and keep them too small in the area. So. Other questions? Yeah. Obviously, you're not relying on no, right. Would be non Yes, right. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's, that's right. No, that's not a constraint. No.